Seated to my right is Vice Chairman Robert Cicero and to my left, Commissioner Talena Matthews. We are accompanied by several members of the PSC staff here this evening and we'll uh, introduce them to you again generally uh, after the meeting uh, because they will be available to answer some of your questions. But those here are Nancy Vensel, Ariel Miller, uh, Connie Hunt, Andrew Melikovich, and James Rhodes. We're here tonight to take public comment in the case of 2018-00005, the joint application of Kentucky Utilities Company and Louisville Gas and Electric Company, Inc. for a certificate of public convenience and necessity for full deployment of advanced metering systems. If you were here for the earlier informational session, you heard about this application in greater detail and also received an explanation of how the Public Service Commission will go about reaching a decision in this case. To reiterate what was explained earlier, the PSC in cases of this nature is required to examine the need for the proposed project or investment to determine whether the applicants have selected the least cost reasonable alternative and whether the proposed project would lead to a wasteful duplication of service. These standards entail a review of the long-term costs and benefits of the proposed project, its potential impact on rates, and the necessity of the project for the future provision of safe, reliable, and adequate service. If you missed the earlier presentation, I would recommend that you view it online at the Public Service Commission website. We understand that any matter involving uh, electric service and rates is likely to produce strong and differing opinions. We trust that everyone here this evening will present their comments in a respectful manner and to respect the right of everyone else to be heard. With that being said, let me explain how we will proceed for the remainder of this event. We are here to listen to the public, but not to take or answer questions. Allowing questions and answers on the record as part of this meeting would create the potential for procedural problems later in this process. Therefore, there will be no presentations by Louisville Gas and Electric or Kentucky Utilities or any of the other parties to this case, nor will there be any question and answer period involving the parties. The Commission will be taking sworn testimony from them in a forthcoming evidentiary hearing. However, Representatives of LG&E and Kentucky Utilities have agreed to remain here after the public comment section is over uh, and to meet with any and all of you informally to discuss and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, in addition, the Office of the Kentucky Attorney General is present this evening and they have uh, four attorneys present who will also be available to you after uh, the hearing or the public comment session this evening, as well some staff members from the Public Service Commission. So you will have an informal opportunity to ask uh, questions and hopefully have them answered. Uh, the public hearing, uh, as previously indicated, will be held on July the 24th at the Public Service Commission's offices in Frankfort. And, and you're welcome to attend, to comment there again, or to view the proceedings live because they'll be streamed live over the internet uh, from our website. So you'll have an opportunity to see what happens and how it happens. And in addition, as Mr. Nelikovich uh, told you earlier, the entire record on this case, including testimony, uh, statistics, is online. And if you go on to the PSC website, you can click on to the case and, and get in there and read some of this yourself. The case, you'll need the case number. So the, the case number is 2018 5 2018-0005. And uh, that's all you'll need to be able to get into the, uh, to get into the hearing and get in to read the testimony. Uh, this evening, what you have this evening is an opportunity for affected utility customers to have their voices heard. Those of you wishing to speak should have indicated your intention to do so when you signed in this evening. If you have not signed in, please do that now, whether or not you intend to speak, so that we may have a complete record 
of this proceeding. And I will add that even though uh, not everyone who is here wished to speak, when uh, at the end of this uh, uh, discussion here, at least statement that I'm making, I will call the people who signed up to speak in the order in which they signed up and then offer anyone else who's here who had, didn't sign up but who would like to speak the opportunity to do so. Uh, based on the number of people who have indicated a desire to speak to date or so far, we're going to allow five minutes per speaker so that everyone has an opportunity to be heard. Our timekeeper will signal you when you have one minute remaining by holding up a yellow card and then when your time is up by holding up a red card. Please be respectful to others and do not disregard the timekeeper when they signal your time has expired. Those of you who do not wish to speak may submit written comments uh, may submit written comments. We have comment forms available for that purpose and those may be turned in tonight to a member of the PSC staff or mailed or faxed to the Public Service Commission. The address and phone number are on the forms. You may also submit comments by email through the Public Service Commission website. As you can see this meeting is being videotaped and the tape will be available for public viewing on the PSC website. A summary of the public comments received tonight will be prepared for the Public Service Commission as part of the case record and made available on the website. All written comments will also be entered into the case record. If you later decide you would like to submit written comments, they will be accepted through the date of the formal evidentiary hearing in this case. That hearing, during which uh, Kentucky Utilities and Louisville Gas and Electric uh, and other parties will present their cases to the Public Service Commission and be subject to cross-examination is scheduled to begin at 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Tuesday, July 24th at the Public Service Commission offices at 211 Sauer Boulevard, Frankfort, Kentucky, and it may last uh, several days. The hearing is open to the public and will be streamed live on the Public Service Commission website. Three important things to keep in mind before we begin. Because the commissioners must rule on the joint application, we cannot answer questions pertaining to the substance of the case. However, as before mentioned, questions you raise during the meeting may well be of assistance to the PSC and staff as we prepare for the evidentiary hearing. The PSC staff will be available after the public comments are concluded to answer any questions that any of you may have regarding procedural matters in the case. The Public Service Commission only has jurisdiction over the rates and service of utilities. We have no jurisdiction over matters such as environmental standards or public health. Those are regulated by a number of federal and state local agencies and local agencies. Therefore, the most helpful comments are those that directly address the merits of the KU lg and &E proposal with respect for the, to the need of the proposed project, its reasonableness, and its projected costs and benefits. If you have concerns or questions about service or billing for individual accounts, the most effective way to have those addressed is to speak with a member of the Public Service Commission staff after this meeting or call our toll-free consumers hotline at 800-772-4636 during regular business hours. Now, when you come up to speak, please state your name and place of residence. And again, please keep your comments to the allotted time so that others may have the opportunity to address the commission. Uh, at this time, I'd ask if there are any public officials present, any elected public officials. Yes, ma'am, would you care to come up and speak and, and make a statement? Sure. 
Thank you. I'm State Representative Attica Scott, and I serve Kentucky House District 41, and I want to affirm you all for holding this hearing. I know that Representative Mackenzie Cantrell and I wrote to you asking that you would hold this hearing on behalf of the folks who will be impacted, who are lg &E customers. I know that Metropolitan Housing Coalition and other folks in our community ask for this hearing, and so we wanted to support them in that. I also want to affirm and thank all of the residents who are here because you are the folks most directly impacted. I look forward to hearing your testimony to see how I, as a legislator, can be responsive. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And, and we'd like to thank you because uh, uh, earlier when this uh, 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 advanced meter, uh, the smart meter uh, case we're, we're involved in now was originally part of a rate case uh, late last year and then was withdrawn and there was a public comment section here and one in Lexington and one somewhere else in the state and we might not have had another had you not uh, asked for it. So we're glad, we're glad to, give, to be here and give your constituents an opportunity to be heard. Any other public officials? Okay. If not, uh, and I apologize, I, I may, uh, I, I may uh, brutalize some of these names because of the handwriting, uh, but I'll try to call them in order. Uh, is it Ray Bundridge? He had to go. Uh, James Haswell. Thank you. I'm James Haswell. I'm at 1332 Hepburn Avenue in Louisville. And um, my understanding is, uh, according to what I've heard tonight, is that uh, if I opt out of the smart meters because my house is a three-plex, even though one unit is never rented, that my monthly bill will go up approximately $150. That's if I use no electricity at all. I will still owe $150 or gas. So um, really, and one of my other concerns is that um, that will um, tremendously affect a portion of the poorest people in the community. And, uh, you know, an 80 year old lady on a fixed income now has to pay an extra 50 some odd dollars a month because she's opted out of the meters. I assume that the people that opt into the meters will have an upcharge that would be similar to that, too. There's no reason why they wouldn't, because opting out is recovering their loss, correct? So, is that right? Okay. So, um, at this point, in terms of my monthly bills, I can see no real advantage for anybody to have these. My understanding is that the research pretty much bears that out. So, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. So, um, my thinking, I'm just wondering, and over and above that, I think separating this from the right case makes it that more, much more confusing for the rate payers to figure out how it's really going to affect us. You know, if we can see the numbers, okay, if we do this, it's going to cost you each $350, okay, but we can't see that now. You know, we just have these vague numbers and nothing to help me determine how it's going to really affect me month to month, year to year. Nor is, has anybody said anything about the dependability of the meters. I've never had a mechanical meter go bad or any problem with it at all. So, I'm just, I'm a cannon. <laughs> okay, thank you. Donald Newman. Yes, my name is Donald Newman. I live in Fairdale, Kentucky. Uh, I'm just wondering, this is 
I don't expect you to answer the question, why the Public Service Commission doesn't follow the federal mandate on the smart meters. Because the federal mandate says that you're supposed to opt into the smart meters, not opt out. New Hampshire is the only state that I've seen with all my research that follow that policy where you have to opt into it if you want them. They, the utility company actually has to send each customer a form for them to fill out. And the customer has to say, yes, I want the smart meters. And they're not charged any extra for it. And I don't understand why LG, well, I do understand why LG&E wants to make all that extra money. It's all profit to them. They want to eliminate their contract meter readers because they don't have their employees are just office employees now. Their meter readers are contract meter readers. So they don't pay them any benefits at all. So the only benefit to these smart meters is going to benefit LG&E and not the public. So I'm going to let it go at that. I, had, you know, I could have said a whole lot more, but anyway, like I said, you know, I hope you all look into that deal about the federal mandate that people are supposed to opt into it, not opt out. Thank you. Jennifer Lockhart. Thank you. So I filed a public paper with a lot more details, a lot more questions, a little bit more facts and figures. Um, so for my verbal part of this is to focus primarily on the safety and then give you a couple of ideas of how to make things better and more profitable for LG&E. So focusing on the safety, I'll start with a story. So after many, many, many hours of research over Wi-Fi safety, I asked my insurance agent, say, insurance agent, this is the deal. Is Wi-Fi safe or is it a safety hazard? And he sighs and he tells me this story about a little boy that died um, from touching a fence in his backyard. And they looked into it, lg and &E looked into it. They had a lot of trouble finding the cause and the official cause, he shrugged his shoulders and put his hands in the air was um, a faulty ground for the air conditioner. But what he was telling me with his body language was he wasn't so sure. And another rumor that I heard in the, in the insurance world is they don't cover Wi-Fi damage. So what do they know that, that they're not sharing with us? So that's the, that's the uh, anecdote. So focusing on uh, the unreasonable safety hazard, which I'm sure is not your responsibility, a shock and burn, the 1999 report posted at the FCC website says that there is a risk of shock and burn from RF and they're unable to measure and tell you how bad it is. And they asked for technology in order to make it better so that they can measure that risk of shock and burn. I don't know if anybody's done that yet. So making things better, more profitable for lg and &E, I know that's what you want. So one thing you can do to make it better is the kilowatt. It's a little free device that other utilities offer that the customer can use, plug into their outlet, into the wall, and it measures how much their devices are using. Another one is a simple, easy computer program where the customer takes a picture, a digital picture of their meter, and then an automatic computer program can read that, and then they can lower their meter fee by sending in that picture before their due date, or eliminate that meter fee altogether, and then folks that want somebody to come read their meter every month and check for safety of the meter can pay the $10 or $12 or whatever you guys are doing right now. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Carol Raskin. I know you will hear this again from other people, people more qualified, but I've made a lifetime of representing low-income people, and now I'm retired. But that doesn't mean that I don't think that this is a real problem for low-income people. Low-income people include seniors, but not all seniors, but many seniors. Not just the 90-year-old woman, but you know, perhaps the 60-year-old who can't work or is a greeter at Walmart. 
Uh, I see something that I did not understand, but if this, this is in an article, that LG, the companies, the utility companies, argued that there would be no hike immediately in customers' rates because they expect their cost of $350 million installation would be offset by savings in the future. It, our, I hope that they're bound by this. This is one plus. In any event, I just want to say that in addition to low-income people, um, there's a problem, evidently. I read Jim Brueggemann's column from January in the Courier Journal where he said it's difficult and he's going to spend time trying to figure out how to work with this meter to optimize his benefits. He probably has by now, but I don't think I ever will. And I don't know how many people are in that same position, but I bet there are a lot. And not just older people, people who just plain don't have access. Probably any 10-year-old could do it, but I don't have a handy grandchild, so um, it's not going to help me. I'm also concerned, and I'm not sure where that's going to fit in, I don't know if anyone is, about the lack of privacy of our data, and also, even more importantly, the info, the information on who we are and other identifying information. If that is not, well, it's not going to ever be 100 percent, but it's one more place that that information could be obtained by hackers who know how to do it, I suspect. That's all. Um, I am not in favor of this personally or f more importantly for other people who can't afford it. Thank you. You're Greg Zaredek. 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 Okay. Thank you. I brought some props. If anybody wants to talk afterwards, I'll be happy to do that. So uh, my name is Greg Zaredek. I live in the city of Louisville, urban service district, and I have a disclaimer that I'm an engineer and I have designed equipment to manufacture electric meters and I've been programming and doing stuff since the 1970s and it's fun, funny to be on the other side LG, people like LG and NKU are our customers so I've got a few notes to, uh, to, uh, just a few things I want to comment on um, for one thing these meters you know they had frictionless bearings this has been bent with they'll turn forever to my knowledge, and I could look up records, but they had a reliability rate of about 95 plus percent for 40 to 50 years. That's why somebody commented, nobody ever come out and work on your meter before. So I'm not against progress, and I'm not against technology. I've been doing it all my life. What I'm against here is the process a little bit. So we need to progress, and things keep happening, things will keep happening. But what I'm warning about a little bit is like, in private industry, when I design something or somebody supplies something to a manufacturer, if it didn't work or stopped working, we could be held directly accountable. So what I want to know is who at the public utility is going to be held accountable when these things fail and how many times they fail and who's going to be held accountable for that. As an example, who here has a router at home? You know, every, everybody. That's what these are. Th what we're doing is we're putting a router on there. So how many times do we have to turn that off and on? How many times do you have to buy that? And how many times is that promise to last for 10 or 20 years and you know you got to go to the store and buy a new one every couple of years. So what I'm asking for, I guess, is, you know, software marketers and hard, these hardware, they're very good at stuff. They take people out, they get you to do the project, but unless they're held accountable, and that's why I'm hoping that we can do this, somebody should be able to say, if this doesn't work, and if it doesn't cost what I said, there's a cost factor and there's a savings factor, and those things have to be proven. We had to do that. It's doable. I'm just worried this is being happened a little bit too fast and the process is not transparent and if I have to as a private citizen go up and try and look through 10,000 pages to figure out if this is true or not, I don't think we have to do that. So what I'm asking is slow down, take a breath. These technologies will happen but I'm not sure they're reliable enough and I'm not sure the cost and benefits have been proven enough. So that's what I'm asking I guess to do that. I'm, and I'll offer some of my expertise either to the commission or to LG or whoever he wants. I was at the plant for a lot of years. I, I know a lot of this stuff. And that's the other thing. There are, believe it or not, you think this is a meter? There's tens of thousands of models in the United States because every utility wants something different. They want the meters the way to interact with the customer and get something they do or don't want. So there's, there's the complex, think about the complexity for that type of a meter. Now you're talking about a computer controlled routing type meter. 
how much complexity is going to be there and who's going to take care of that reliability. I'm serious. There's tens of thousands of models. Every utility has multiple models, tiny differences. So we really got to watch this stuff. It, there's more to the technology th than you might think there be, would be. Um, and if, say, if you can't hold somebody accountable at the utility if this doesn't work or if it fails, can we as ratepayers get it back? When my router, which is what this is going to be, goes out, and if my parent is on a life support system and something happens, can I get money back from the utility? In other words, that's a way to prove reliability. I, what I'm getting at is, like, you know, a mechanic on a plane goes up and flies the plane before he lets the pilot fly it. That's the way it used to be. Somebody should be held accountable that if this doesn't work in the future, if it doesn't live up to the promises and expectations, then somebody should be held accountable or somebody should get some of that money back. That's something that I'm asking for to think about, too. And I've probably got a lot more to say, and I've, I've <laughs> got a lot more things, but I thank you for your time. And please think about that, and I'll be ready to answer questions if needed. Thank, thank you. Mary Bryan. Hi, I'm, my name is Mary Bryan. I live at 1463 South First Street in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the smart meters. I am an LG&E customer and I also serve on two boards for low-income utility programs in the LG&E service area. In my board experience for the programs serving low-income households, we know that many are renters and they do not have control over fixing up their homes. We use Project Warm and We Care when possible, but so much is beyond the control of the people, like efficient appliances. So they will be paying without being able to take advantage of seeing and adjusting their usage. This is an expensive proposal that asserts that the cost will be offset by the savings and benefits in the long run. That's a bold projection that has not been backed up by information from other service areas. These projections are speculative guesses, and we should wait until we have evidence from other areas that these kinds of projects actually reduce costs and generate benefits. In the instance of smart meters, the ratepayers of LG&E will be the ones who pay for the shortfall of such an expensive proposal with additional increases in their monthly utility bills that will exacerbate the rate increases that continue to occur. This proposal has the potential to make even more customers unable to pay their monthly utility bills. Especially low-income customers will be placed at an even greater risk of losing utility service. The opt-out part of this proposal is not really an option as customers, especially low-income customers, will find it difficult to pay more each month on their utility bill for not participating. Ultimately, all LG&E customers will experience increased utility costs as a result of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Lynn Cunningham. My name is Sarah Lynn Cunningham. I live at 1711 Edgeland Avenue, and I am an LG&E customer. Um, I have submitted written comments out front. Um, and I want to thank you for coming to Louisville because this is a big help to us not to have to go to Frankfurt during the business day. Um, I am representing today the Louisville Climate Action Network, which is a network of businesses, community groups, religious organizations, educational institutions, and approaching a thousand individual Kentuckians. The Climate Action Network itself has not yet come out against smart metering. We are open to the idea. However, we believe that this proposal isn't ready for prime time yet. We don't think it deserves to be approved. Um, one of our concerns is that $717 million, according to the Attorney General's uh, expert, is a whole lot of money and if you were to ask us where could we best spend that to benefit the consumer it would not be smart meters it would be energy efficiency programs she notes as we've just lost all of our DSM programs uh, renewable energy projects pollution control equipment or grid hardening all of those I think are much more pressing needs from the consumer standpoint uh, 
I also believe the fact that, as I understand it, the data of our own usage won't be available to us until the next day is an unacceptable thing. If the utility can have the data in real time, I believe the consumer should be able to have it too. And this is why. For example, people you, a lot of people use hair dryers all the time. If mine looks pretty ratty, that's because I don't. But when you use a hair dryer, it is sucking the juice. And if people have to wait to the next day to see their consumption, they're not going to notice this spike and go, you know, really, I think I can just give up the hair dryer. People can't learn if the data was the next day because, frankly, most of them will forget to even check if they were wondering how did the hair dryer do things. Probably my biggest concern is that this money will probably, I fear, end up on the basic service charge. And that's the mandatory flat fee that everybody pays for the privilege of being connected to the utilities. And I think it's inherently regressive because the elderly senior who lives in a one-bedroom apartment and doesn't have much control over everything and is on a fixed income, they're paying the same share of the fixed cost as a couple with two six-digit incomes living in a McMansion. It's inherently regressive. And then I think about my foster son. He doesn't have Social Security like the elderly person does. He works in food service. He never gets 40 hours. He never gets benefits. And for them to have to pay a higher and higher basic service charges, which is really where I think this will go, I think it's regressive and very problematic. Everybody else has uh, spoken sufficiently on the privacy matter. I think we are owed clarification on that before this gets approved. Um, and lastly, we believe that if this were made part of a formal rate case where we could have more proof and documentation of the cost and the benefits, that would be fairer, it would be more democratic, it would be more transparent, and the Louisville Climate Action Network might say, okay, we agree with this, but we think it's too nebulous at this point. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Joshua White. My name is Joshua White. I'm on the board of the uh, Sierra Club for Greater Area Louisville. I'm also a resident. I live uh, 2134 Woodbourne Avenue in the Highlands and I'm an LG&E customer. Um, I'm probably one of the customers that this uh, campaign was targeted at. I have a meter which is a smart type of meter. <clears throat> I asked for it and I it's one of the things I wanted because I thought it was going to help me save energy. I'm the type of person to be proactive. I have a kilowatt. Those are actually very cool. I have one of those. And um, done a lot of insulation work. It's almost like a hobby at this point just for the amount of work that we've done on my house in order to save energy. But the smart meter that we got has been almost, I would say it's been completely un unuseful for the purpose of helping me, the customer. I do think that from a business model, it would be very useful for eliminating meter readers and, and other types of savings. But um, the things I would expect to see in something that was actually marketed to help customers, actually instead of just a sham device or something that the people developed that didn't quite get the idea of why customers would want it, um, if you have a cell phone and you have a data plan, then you don't just guess or have to go to the website anymore to check how much data you have left. You get a, you've used 50% of your, your data. You've used 75%. You've used 90%. You're at 110%. Or you use more data this month than you've ever used in the rest of the year. So these are type of, of, um, of features that are designed to actually help the customer manage and decrease their, you know, something that they might want to decrease, like uh, you know, data or energy. Real time, you can get real time is essential. It, people don't have a very good memory for something that they did the day before if they do remember to check. Um, that's the big problem for me. I I don't check on what I did yesterday. I want to know what I'm doing right now or what I did an hour ago, and I want it on an app. I don't want to have to go and log in at a computer or even log into a website. I want it already logged in. I want to be able to open it up and see it. So these are the type of features that you would expect from a program that was actually developed and designed to, for that purpose. So for that matter, I think it's kind of a sham or underthought. It wasn't quite, it's not quite done yet. It's a beta test type of thing. Um, the other thing that I'm really concerned about on this, though, is if you're going to ask for that much money ahead of time 
for something that's going to be so successful at decreasing costs. I'm very worried that maybe since this isn't a, no one's being sworn in, this isn't a rate case, that lg &E may not be um, entirely truthful. They may be obfuscating the risk associated with actually um, making that type of savings. And so, you know, they'll say, hey, we'll get $350 million. They're going to have to figure out how to pay for that somewhere. They're going to pass it on probably, like some type of rate increase. And I think that if it was actually going to save as much money as they think that it would save, they would either be doing it right now slowly, you know, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, and taking the savings and paying for the new equipment. Or that maybe they think it's going to be a great idea, but either way, they're going to make a profit from it, so it doesn't really matter if it works or not, because this isn't part of a rate case. This is a, you know, they're just, let's roll out this, this cool new technology and, and put a lot of glam on it. Um, I think that is, that's pretty much everything except uh, the last thing I want to know, um, I would want to know is if they have the ability to turn off the power remotely using this. And if they do, I'd say a city the size of Louisville having um, privacy and security that's not fully implemented yet would be a national security risk. I mean, a city our size suddenly having all its power cut off by the Russians, I mean, that would be a huge deal. And of course, um, whatever we do is likely to be copied by other cities. So I don't want to set a precedent for that. We got to be better than that. Um, I, I, this is the first time I've ever had the honor of talking with you, uh, the commission, and I, I appreciate your time and uh, coming here to Louisville to uh, hear our comments. Thank you. We appreciate everyone who's, who's come here to speak. Now, that concludes the list of the speakers who signed up based on the information that was given me. Is there anyone else here now who would like to come up and make a comment? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lisa Lee Williams. I live at 104 Stoll Avenue, Rear. I live in a tiny house on purpose, under 400 square feet. Um, I'm also an LG&E customer, and I also represent the Affordable Energy Corporation. And uh, we have the privilege of managing LG&E's Home Energy Assistance Program, and we thank you all as a commission for supporting, reinvesting in the community in that regard. Um, I am new to this, so I am a little concerned about how the home energy funding, the meter reading funding, will be affected by this type of technological transition. Um, if there's a high cost in setting everything up, will these clients, 130% of uh, poverty um, rate currently, will they be forgotten? And are, is there a priority to make sure that they're not? in this process. Is there going to be some consideration that if their rate, based on some of the testimony today, if it's going to cost them $50 more just to have this new technology, are we going to increase the HEA benefit by that same amount of percentage? I would hope so. And then the other thing um, that concerns me is the technology or the governing principles that you're using to make these decisions are based on 1982. Did I hear that right earlier? That's a long time ago in technology speak. <laughs> and so I just want to know uh, what has the commission, or, or on the 24th, because I'll be there too, on the 24th, what has the commission done to uh, ramp up your knowledge in terms of technological strategies and energy and utility metering uh, to help speak to your decision-making process? So thank you so much for your support so far, and uh, look forward to hearing from you again on the 24th. Thank, thank you. you. Any, anyone else like to speak? Okay, yes, ma'am. My name is Sharon Lear, and I use the address PO Box 91041, Louisville, Kentucky, 40291, and I am an LG&E customer on Winter Garden Court. I did not plan to speak. I did leave a paper out uh, there tonight. But with all these intelligent people speaking, I had to add one more thing, and that is why have we not looked into new renewable energy, such as the turbine trees that are, have become a real hit in Paris, France? Why do people in the U.S. invent all of these fancy new things? This is renewable energy, and even if the wind is blowing less than five miles an hour, you can create energy. 
this could be such a big help to everybody. In some areas, they have trees. I have pictures on the internet. They have them shaped like flowers, like, uh, like leaves, like all sorts of things. And this is really renewable energy. Instead of going back and doing something that is old technology, I would like to see us move to new technology. Thank you all very much for your time and being here. Okay, thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Okay, if not, uh, at this time I would like uh, everyone here who's here on behalf of Kentucky Utilities and Louisville Gas and Electric to please stand so that members of the public can see who you are for purposes of maybe asking questions or after the meeting is over. And the Kentucky Attorney General's Office would, uh, uh, Ms. Goodman, would you and your group please stand? <laughs> These individuals from the Kentucky Attorney General's Office who represent consumers in the case and PSC staff who will be available. Okay, so that's it as far as what the commissioners can do. Uh, we appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, I can assure you that everything that's been said here will be taken into consideration during and after the hearing and before a decision is made. Uh, there are at present written comments in the record that each of you can see for yourself on the, the Public Service Commission website. I can also assure you that each of us have read or will have read every one of those comments uh, and so uh, hopefully we'll be in a position to render a fair, a just and impartial decision in this case knowing that uh, Whatever we do, not everybody is going to be completely happy with it. But thank you uh, uh, once again, and good evening. Thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you